Okay, thank you very much for that introduction and that uh, wonderful pronunciation of my last name. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'd, I'd like to, this afternoon, um, I was given the task of speaking about um, yogurt and weight management, but I, I'm gonna start by speaking about dairy and weight management for two reasons. Uh, first and most importantly, um, in, my, in my opinion, and I think has been true this morning in other presentations, it's critical to consider any potential effect of yogurt uh, in the context of, its, uh, of the effects of, of dairy itself. When we're focusing on yogurt, we, we need to try to determine if the effect of yogurt is just a consequence of the fact that it's dairy, or um, if, there's, uh, if there are effects that are unique to yogurt, and I think that's been brought up in, in many of the sessions earlier today. Uh, the second reason is that I was, that I'm going to talk a little bit about, about um, dairy as a whole, is that I was asked to speak for 20 minutes. And if I was going to speak on yogurt and weight, it would be about a five minute talk. So, um, so let me start with my, uh, my financial disclosures. I am currently receiving uh, uh, grant support from Dan and to examine the relationship between dairy and health. And I'm also uh, on a, uh, Dan and Scientific Advisory Board. All right, so um, let me start uh, the examination of dairy and weight uh, with this meta-analysis of, of Chen and colleagues. This figure is from the paper summarizes the results of 29 uh, separate trials and uh, that examined uh, dairy as an intervention in, in uh, uh, the, the effect of dairy interventions on, on weight um, change. And they've presented these uh, um, different, these uh, slides, uh, excuse me, these data separately for um, studies that have uh, uh, used um, energy restriction uh, and those without energy restriction. <clears throat> um, their findings overall suggest that the, the studies, the effect of dairy without energy restriction, um, there really is no effect they, they see in this uh, summary. But there is a suggestion of a modest effect in those studies that, that, um, that have uh, used energy restriction. So um, I, to, this afternoon, I, I re really don't want to debate the findings of this or other meta-analysis of, of dairy and weight, because I could do that. I, I, I have some, some few issues with this meta-analysis, some other meta-analysis. But again, the reason I, I wanted to, sh to show this to you is to, first of all, remind you that there are potential effects of dairy on, on weight, indep perhaps independent of yogurt. And um, also to show you that these 29 trials um, provide little evidence to enlighten us about yogurt and weight. Actually, among these 29 trials, there were only two that considered yogurt as a, as a separate intervention. And those were both energy, uh, studies of energy restriction. Um, one of those trials was that of uh, Thomas and colleagues and the other, the second was Zemmel. And you can see from this slide that the, effect, the effects in both of these trials were quite similar. The, uh, the, in the um, Thomas uh, intervention, they saw about a, 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 an effect of yogurt of about 1.4 kilograms less weight gain, or for me, greater weight loss. And in the, also in the Zemmel trial, uh, they saw a, a greater weight loss of about 1.6 um, kilograms. So I just very briefly want to go into these two studies in a little bit greater detail. Now the purpose of the um, Thomas uh, study was to examine the effect of yogurt sub supplementation on changes in body composition in overweight women engaged in, resist in a resistance training program. It was a relatively small study. They had 29 individuals, uh, 15, of, uh, 15 of them who were assigned to the, to the yogurt intervention and 14 to an isocaloric sucrose beverage. This was consumed before and after exercise uh, for 16 weeks, and this was in combination with a 250 kilocalorie per day energy deficit. As I showed you on the last slide, the difference between the two treatments was about 1.4 kilograms with a greater loss of weight in the yogurt group. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the Zemmel study uh, was designed to uh, uh, examine whether yogurt would accelerate weight and fat loss induced by caloric restriction in healthy obese adults. Again, a relatively small study. Uh, I don't have the numbers here. Uh, the, I think there were 34 individuals in the study. Subjects were, uh, were 
uh, prescribed a 500 kilocalorie per day deficit diet for 12 weeks, then randomized either to a controlled diet providing at most one serving of dairy products, so zero or one serving per day of dairy products, or a diet containing three a daily six ounce servings of fat free yogurt. <clears throat> now, this slide shows the results of the Zemmel study, and they observed um, about a 30 percent reduction in. Uh, weight over the course of the, the uh, 12 weeks. They saw um, about a 60 percent reduction uh, um, uh, uh, in, in uh, a greater, greater reduction in, in fat, in body fat. And they also observed uh, about a, um, a 15 percent uh, reduction in the, in the amount of lean mass loss. So there, there was, they had a greater uh, 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 loss of weight, greater loss of body weight, and less loss of lean mass. So just summarizing, I mean, this is, that's all we have there. So summarizing these two trials, I mean, both of these studies are consistent with an effect of, of, of yogurt on body weight, yogurt or dairy. Um, because there was no non-yogurt dairy intervention for the comparison, though, we can't attribute the observed effects to yogurt itself. And that's, I think, one of the limitations of, of, of in something we have to c consider in any interventions that we do. If we're interested in looking specifically at yogurt, we have to have non-yogurt dairy controls. Um, in addition to the, to the, uh, obs uh, the intervention studies uh, relating um, uh, uh, yogurt to, uh, or dairy to, uh, to weight, there was also a systematic review of, uh, there's a large literature on, on observational um, uh, evidence. And um, this slide summarizes a systematic review of the prospective uh, cohort studies. Um, these investigators identified 19 prospective cohort st studies of dairy in, uh, intake and weight change. Eight of these studies showed a protective association of dairy against increasing weight gain. One study reported a significant protective association, but this was only seen among men who were initially overweight. Seven reported no association with dairy intake. One reported increased weight gain with increasing dairy intake. Two reported either a decreased or increased weight gain depending on the specific dairy foods. Only three of these studies in the review considered yogurt as a separate food item. However, subse subsequent to the publication of this paper in 2011, there was uh, an additional uh, study published in 2012 that also considered yogurt separately. Okay, in this slide, I've attempted to uh, try to summarize these four um, studies side by side. But before going uh, into detail of describing the studies, I wanted to note that these, these four studies gave minimal detail about, uh, uh, um, really about the examination of yogurt in, in these uh, cohorts, because none of these styles, uh, studies were designed to look at yogurt and weight. Um, two of the studies, um, the Cardia study and the Supermax study, the purpose was look at overall dairy, and the other two studies looked um, not only at dairy but at multiple food groups. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, um, the first study listed here, the 2002 study of, of uh, Pereira, was performed using data from overweight young adult participants, who, <coughs> excuse me, who were sampled from four large U.S. metropolitan areas. As you can see, but over half of this uh, sample uh, was black. Um, they did not report um, mean BMI in this study, but the um, prevalence of, of obesity among the white participants was about 45 percent and about 66 percent among the black participants. They assessed diet in this, uh, in this study using a 28-day food frequency questionnaire, quite extensive food frequency. Uh, they assessed this at baseline and then at year seven of the study. Now, yogurt intake in this study was very low. The median intake uh, among the black participants was uh, basically zero servings per week, whereas the median intake among white participants, participants was 0.3 servings per week. <clears throat> the uh, um, study of uh, uh, Drapeau and colleagues examined uh, food groups and weight change in a small cohort of parents and adult children from Quebec. Uh, yogurt intake was assessed at baseline and at the, at the end of the study, six years into the study, using uh, three-day diet records. Now, one thing about the, um, the use of, of three-day, I mean, 
we, this study may have had have mis, uh, repre represented or underestimated the, the intake of yogurt in this, in this population. Because of the episodic nature of yogurt intake, a three-day diet record might not be the ideal um, means to capture that intake. And again, this uh, study did not report um, what the yogurt intake was in this uh, sample. The uh, Suvimax trial is a large uh, antioxidant, vitamin, and mineral intervention study that, was re that recruited participants from all over France. Um, in this study, they collected dietary data using computerized 24-hour uh, recalls. To, in order to be included in the study, the investigators required that the participants had to have at least six computerized 24-hour uh, recalls within the first 18 months of follow-up. <clears throat> Now, this, in this study, obviously, it's, it's a little bit different being in France than, than in, in uh, North American uh, populations. And here, rather than reporting servings of yogurt in terms of s servings per week, they do it in terms of servings per day. So the mean intake uh, among men in this population was about a half a serving of yogurt per day, whereas the mean intake among women was about two-thirds of a serving of yogurt per day. And the, uh, the final uh, 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 prospective observational study was um, that of Mosafarian and colleagues published in 2011. And um, they used uh, data on a, a hundred, more than 120,000 men and women from the three Harvard Health Professionals cohorts, the Nurses Health, Nurses Health Study, the Nurses Health Study 2, and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. Um, they, at baseline, they excluded uh, anyone who uh, was considered obese or had any chronic disease. These investigators measured um, diet using food fixture questionnaires, and over in this uh, a specific study, they re uh, required three to five food frequency questionnaires um, to be included in the study. And again, this uh, this paper did not report the usual yogurt intake in this population. Okay, so this slide presents the results from these four studies. Um, in the Cardia study, the investigators reported that the 10-year obesity incidence was cut in half, essentially, uh, the odds ratio of 0.47 per each serving of yogurt per day. The Quebec family study investigators did not um, see any association with weight change. They looked at change in yogurt over time relative to weight change. So they did not see any association between the, the change in yogurt consumption between baseline and follow-up relative to the change in weight between baseline and follow-up. They did, however, report that yogurt was positive, that the change in yogurt was positively associated with the change in waist circumference uh, over the course of the study with about uh, 0.4 um, centimeters additional a waste change per serving um, for over the six years of follow-up. Now, the Suvimax uh, uh, trial investigators um, stratified the sample not only by sex but also by weight status. And they observed that in normal weight men there was no association. However, in overweight men they observed that high yogurt consumers gained about 55% less weight over the course of the study um, compared to the low yogurt consumers. And they saw a similar result for waist circumference. However, in the women, everything was a little bit different. Uh, first of all, they observed in normal weight women that the high yogurt consumers gained about 53% more weight. And they observed no association between um, the uh, yogurt consumption and uh, weight change in the overweight women. And, it, and they observed no associations between yogurt and change in waist circumference. And finally, the, uh, the, the study from the uh, health professionals cohorts, um, which has already been uh, uh, shown earlier this morning, showed that the four-year weight gain um, was about um, point, just, just to clarify, they're, they're looking at weight gain, so, so everybody gained weight, but, but over four years, the weight gain in these cohorts was about 0.82 pounds less for every serving of yogurt consumed, and they observed similar associations in all three cohorts. Okay, so um, 
Given the limited uh, data specific to yogurt intake and weight management, my, uh, weight management, my colleagues, and I felt that it would be valuable to revisit the relationship between dairy and weight with a focus on yogurt. We felt that the Framingham Heart Study offspring cohort would be an ideal uh, uh, setting for examining the relationship between yogurt and weight because of the availability of multiple measures of dietary intake and the use of clinic-based weight and weight circumference measurements and a, a long follow-up period. In this case, we follow up for over 15 years. So we had a, a sample of about 3,440 participants with almost 12,000 observations uh, over, this, uh, over a follow-up period of about 12.9 um, uh, years. Uh, the data we used were based on um, four, uh, forgive me, on, uh, yeah, on four uh, uh, exams uh, which, uh, which were collected um, between, or data from the four exams which were collected between 1991 and 2008. Um, we assessed um, a diet using the Harvard Food Frequency Questionnaire. We um, based yogurt on the average intakes at the start and the end of an, each exam interval. We, we, we actually style the study very closely to that of the Mosafarian study. The difference is they had equal exam periods. All of their exam periods were four-year exam periods. The Framingham, they ra could range from two and a half years up to about five years. So to, to, to deal with that, we uh, again calculated uh, the uh, weight change within each exam interval, but we annualized the, um, the weight change. So it's looking at change per year. So we could account for the varying length and in, in uh, of the exam intervals. For those of you who care, we used a repeated measures regression approach to examine these associations. Um, we adjusted for a number of different factors. As has been mentioned this morning, I mean, yo yogurt consumers do differ substantially from non-yogurt consumers. So in any of this type of observational work, we have to be really careful and try to account for those differences. So we um, adjusted for sex and also for uh, a number of variables as time-dependent variables, and those included age, smoking status, physical activity, blood pressure, diabetes status, cholesterol-lowering medication use, blood lipids, total energy intake, and diet quality, quality. And we assessed diet quality using the Dietary Guidelines Adherence Index Score. We also tested for interactions between dairy consumption in both sex and BMI, but none of those interactions were statistically significant. For the purpose of the, um, the presentation today, we, we categorized um, total dairy, we categorized dairy as total dairy, which included high-fat dairy and low-fat dairy, yogurt, and then to try to capture the, the, you know, the difference between yogurt and, and total dairy, we also examined total dairy excluding yogurt. <clears throat> uh, these are the um, uh, participant characteristics for the cohort at the fifth examination. Um, because the, you'll notice here that fifth examination we only had 3,099 subjects. There's about 300 subjects who we didn't have data for at the fifth examination, but we inc still included in the, um, in the analysis. We just started them at a later interval, so we still included them in the, in the follow-up. The average age at the fifth examination for these individuals was about 54 years. Uh, about 46% of the sample was, was men. Uh, they were, on average, quite overweight. <clears throat> uh, about 19% was, 19 was ci uh, regular cigarette smokers. Uh, on average, uh, these individuals consumed about two servings of dairy per day, and that was pretty much equally split between high-fat and low-fat dairy. And on average, this population consumed just a little under one serving of yogurt per day. <clears throat> These are the results from uh, showing annual change in weight by total dairy consumption. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, comparing those who consumed three or more servings per day relative to those who consumed less than a serving t per day, we saw about a 50% reduction in weight gain over the course of the follow-up. This slide shows the relation, that same relationship by yogurt intake. And again, we can see um, comparing this in case, in this case, we're comparing three greater equal 
to three servings per week, not day, to those with a less than one serving per week. And again, be comparing those two categories, we still see about a 50% reduction in the uh, uh, rate of weight gain. I think it's important though, to note that, that uh, two things. First of all, we didn't see any um, reduction in, in uh, the rate of weight gain and uh, or, or we uh, saw it only among those who were consuming three or more servings per day, uh, per week of, of yogurt. But I think more importantly, or more interestingly, is the fact that we're seeing the same reduction uh, in weight over follow-up with three servings per week as we did with total dairy, where we were looking at three servings per day, up to three servings per day. This slide shows the annual change in weight by total dairy consumption, excluding yogurt. And as you can see here, the, the association has been attenuated. Um, the, the, the difference now between the highest and lowest uh, categories of, of dairy consumption is only 30% rather than 50%. And the, the P for trend is no longer statistically significant. This slide shows the annual change in waist circumference by total dairy. And again, you see a nice trend across the categories of, of total dairy consumption. And the difference um, between these uh, uh, groups is about 15%, between the highest and the lowest categories, is about 15% in, in regarding the, the annual change in, in waist circumference. Again, with yogurt, in this, well, in this case with yogurt, we see actually a slightly stronger uh, association. The difference now between the highest and lowest categories is about 20%, a little bit greater than that which we saw for total dairy. And then again, when we look at total dairy excluding yogurt, again, we see an attenuation of the association with total dairy. Um, still seeing the trend, but it's no longer statistically significant. So in, in summary, you know, yogurt consumption uh, appears to be associated with smaller gains in, in weight and waist circumference. I think the support from our study and also from that of Mozafarian. Uh, but these associations may not be unique to yogurt as, uh, as other dairy products were also related to changes in weight and waist circumference, albeit in a weaker manner. And in terms of the gaps in the literature, what we, we really know and don't know, I mean, this, although there's a large body of data relating dairy intake to weight management, we know very little about the relationship, specific relationship between yogurt and weight management. So I think we have a, a fairly large gap uh, in, in our knowledge regarding uh, the potential benefits of yogurt. Thank you. We have time for uh, several quick questions and quick answers. Andrew Prentice again. I, I, I'm sorry if I seem a, a curmudgeon, but I'm still deeply troubled by this issue of residual confounding. So in your analysis, you, you put in a lot of covariates, but as I read it, none of those covariates could capture health behaviors that are likely to be heavily related to yogurt consumption. So the first thing I want to do is to make that as a really important research agenda point. I mean, to, you know, if you, were, if you were nastier than me, you could say this data means nothing. Yeah. Um, I don't say that. <laughs> uh, but the issue is that, so the question is, do you have any other measures in the Framingham that you could put in? I mean, I would, put in, I would want to put in, you know, IQ, professional occupation, a level of education, weight of the spouse. There's a whole load of things that we could put in there, attitudes to healthy body weight that we could put in there, which would help us to tease out these very important associations. We, we do, I mean, first of all, to, to address the question, we, I mean, we feel one of the most important potential confounders, first of all, to say, yeah, we, residual confounding is always a concern. And, you know, we, with, with um, uh, adjusting for any of these factors, we choose these to try to, to tease out, um, uh, you know, alternate explanations for what we're seeing. Uh, you know, our feeling, for example, is that, is that um, uh, you know, diet and diet quality, we know that the people who consume yogurt have better diets. And so that was a big focus of what we did. We looked not in the, uh, the results I presented here, looked at, at uh, overall diet quality, but we also adjusted for 
every different food group um, uh, uh, that we could look at. So we spent a lot of time trying to get this to go away by adjusting for other dietary factors, for other nutrients associated with it, things like that. So, so that, that really had a minimal impact on the association we're seeing. Even with the residual confounding, we would assume that when we start adjusting for, for overall diet quality, um, that we'd see some reduction, some attenuation, but the, the attenuation was minimal. Uh, in terms of other lifestyle factors, uh, you know, one of the important ones in, in terms of weight would be physical activity. We adjusted for physical activity, but my concern with that measure is, is that we don't measure Framingham, and none of us in epidemiology really can get a good grasp, I think, on, on uh, energy expenditure. So, so although we measure, we measure and control for it, I think we have a lot of potential uh, residual confounding um, for physical activity. Some of the other measures um, you mentioned, we don't have, in Framingham, we don't have any attitudinal questions about weight. Uh, there, there are questions. Um, they do collect information, I don't believe, on income, but they do on, on education. And I'm, I don't recall whether we have, we've actually looked at it as I look at my postdoc who's done the analyses, <laughs> um, whether we've actually uh, adjusted for education, but I don't think we have. Can I, can I just make it clear that I'm not trying to undermine the data yeah. at all. I'm trying to oh, yeah. do the reverse. I'm trying to strengthen it. Yeah. So please don't let me give the impression that I'm anti this data yeah. or, or in any way anti yoga. Quite the reverse is the case. I'm trying to strengthen our case. No, I, and, I, and I agree. I think we have to, any, any observational analysis, we have to try to shoot it down ourselves. We have to try to look to see what alternative hypotheses there might be to explain these, these such as change differences in lifestyle, and, and as someone mentioned this morning, wearing sandals, you know, I think you did, you know, <laughs> we didn't have sandals, but, but uh, yeah, sandal use, but, but if, you know, if we had that, I mean, we try to use that as a hypothesis, try to, try to see if we can explain away what we've seen with these alternative hypotheses. So I think it's very important. What you, the, the points you raise are, are critical, and, and, uh, uh, and, um, and I think we should do more. I mean, whenever we see an association, we should do everything as investigators, everything we can to try to, to shoot that down ourselves before we send it out and have other people shoot it down for us. So. I'm sorry, um, just a follow-up answer to that question, because uh, uh, I did the analysis, so I thought that I might uh, answer that specific question. So actually, in terms of the com uh, residual confounding factors, we did, uh, we did two sets of analysis. So the first analysis, as Paul showed here, we adjusted for the DGI score, which is uh, an index score to assess the participants' adherence to the diet, uh, 2005 dietary guidelines. So in that uh, DGI score, we captured uh, each item, uh, each recommendations made in the dietary guidelines and um, by using that score we were able to uh, capture the overall diet quality of the participants so um, in that sense we uh, uh, the results shown here um, the uh, the association between uh, yogurt and the uh, uh, smaller weight gain is uh, we we are um, confident that it uh, it can it's kind of uh, independent of the participant overall diet quality because we adjusted for that. And also we, we did another uh, uh, sensitivity analysis by adjusting for uh, individual food groups rather than the, the overall diet quality DGI score. And in that sensitivity analysis, uh, we observed a very similar association as uh, you uh, just saw here. So I think, and also uh, for like uh, education and physical activity and smoking status, we, we adjusted for all of, all of those uh, information. But in terms of the income, um, I don't, um, if I don't recall wrong, we don't have that information on hand, so we were not able to uh, take that into account. But yeah, that, that's a very good point that we should definitely look at and do it. Thank you. Uh, André, last question, a quick one. Very nice presentation, Paula. I was wondering, in, in those subjects that gain less weight after taking yogurt, uh, have you had the ability or the, 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 the opportunity actually to look at the fat distribution? Because we know that those that are going to lose more of the visceral fat will have a better cardiometabolic profile. I don't know if you have imaging data, but the other way to do it would be to measure uh, blood triglycerides 
uh, which along with uh, waste circumference and the BMI can give you a good index about which one in these cohorts actually lost more visceral fat. Yeah. Now, we, we, um, uh, apart from waist circumference, which, which doesn't necessarily correlate that well, but, but we, we, uh, do, we have imaging, but only at one exam. We don't have it longitudinally, so we really couldn't assess that. We do, I believe, have triglycerides, though, at, at all of the exams, so that's something we could probably look at. Thanks. Thank you very much.